Okay, I'm connected here. All right, I'm connected. My, my mic is connected to my boot here in a very Wonder Woman-esque move, so. Okay, I, I want to just say first, that is not what happened <laughs> at all. Um, she, she did give me the pat. I do remember her first. There's so many inaccuracies, I really don't know where to start, but. <laughs> She gave me the packet of information, and I, it, that was two years ago. So at the time, I had a one-year-old um, and four-year-old twins. And my husband said, if you say yes to one other thing and leave me for one other night or one other weekend event, I'm going to kill you. Blame it on Steve and your publicist in New York. So that's really what it was. Uh, but I, uh, she did win me over the second time that we, that we met. And um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, what a beautiful library. Um, I grew up going to libraries. Every, we would move every couple of years. We would always go. The first thing we would do is go get a library card. My mother's a retired librarian. She's, she's back here somewhere. Um, and uh, it's, just, it's just a thrill to be invited to, um, to such a beautiful one and such gracious staff and, and dear Amanda, my soulmate. So. <laughs> Um, today, I, I thought I would just talk very generally about my background, um, how I came to, to be a, to a writer, a novelist, um, a bit of my process of writing, um, my, my five novels, um, just touch on each one very, very generally, and then talk a little bit about what it's been uh, like to watch my, my, first, my first book come to life um, on the big screen, coming on May 6th. Um, so, and then, and then just, we'll do some Q&A. Um, I, I think probably this is true for, for all the writers today, most of the writers anyway, and most um, that I've, who I've met is I always knew I wanted to write since the time I was very young. I remember in the first grade, uh, kindergarten or first grade, I learned the word author and I went around saying it all the time. I want to be an author. It's very, um, very self-important. But um, I, I would write stories and, 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 and poems and submit them to magazines and occasionally win an honorable mention in Cricket Magazine. Never really much more than that, but um, it was really my passion. Um, I, I started to keep a journal. Um, uh, January 1st, 1983, I was in the fifth grade, and I didn't skip a day writing in my journal for 20 years, not a single day. Um, and they're very boring entries. Um, sometimes they have just one line, but um, I was very neurotic about writing and, and, and cared very deeply about it. But at some point along the, the way, I was uh, derailed by um, the decision to go to law school. And um, I think that, looking back, um, a lot of lawyers uh, have this personality flaw where they want to achieve, but they, have, they don't know exactly what they want to achieve. So they, they, go, they go to law school, unlike people who go to med school who want to be doctors. Um, and I think I fell into that trap. I, knew, I never stopped wanting to, to write, but I was too afraid to, to pursue something that I cared about so much for fear of failure. So um, I went to uh, law school at the University of Virginia and um, loved those three years. I really enjoyed the study of law, um, the academic setting. It's a beautiful town in Charlottesville. Um, but then I graduated, and I went to a large uh, litigation firm in New York. And the first day, I knew I had made a very, very terrible, misguided oh. mistake. I was learning the phone systems and just thinking I, I, I hate it here. Um, but I had law school loans at that point, and, um, and I, I needed to stay there. So I stayed for five years, and during that period of time, I wrote a novel, a young adult novel, a very quiet coming-of-age story um, called Lily Holding True. And um, at the end of, uh, I guess, about four years, I had paid off my loans and started to, um, and, and had finished the manuscript and had started the process of of trying to, to find an agent um, and uh, was successful and found, found one, which felt like a m massive hurdle from everything I had heard about how hard it is to get an agent. Um, unfortunately, um, my, uh, my the success ended with, with that hurdle because um, the, the rejections from the publishers rolled in after that. And by the end, I think the first four came, and I think there were eight total. Um, I know there were eight total. Who am I kidding, right? <laughs> And um, the, uh, towards the end of that, that awful you know, waiting process, um, I couldn't even get my agent at this point, who had probably written me off. She knew, that, she knew that, um, that I was not going to be her next greatest client. 
Um, she wouldn't even write back to me to tell me, you know, that, that, to, to give me closure on this first uh, foray into the world of publishing. Um, so I, I kept sending her emails, kept sending her emails, and finally I sent her one that said, you know, Happy New Year. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm aware that the news might, you know, is, is probably not um, good, but I would love to, you know, just have this, you know, just please e answer me. And she wrote back, um, she wrote back, they all rejected it. And um, that's all she wrote. And I have that email um, on my website. And um, because I was in uh, this legal world of this large firm for so many years and learned to redact a lot of things on documents, I redacted her name on my website. But her name is Jody Rhodes. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, bat outing the little town in South Carolina. Uh, Jody Rhodes, uh, not a nice person. My sister asks about her, my very loyal um, older sister asks about her. I'd say once a month her name will come up. Do you think Jody knows that your movies, your books being made? Do you think Jody knows how many, that, that you're number one in Poland? Uh, <laughs> She really did send me that email. My book just hit number one. I, I, I can't, I can't qu claim that feat in the United States. I've lost, I've finished twice now to uh, vampire books, but in, uh, in Poland they appreciate, you know, <laughs> books about relationships. And um, but in any event, um, I, so I decided, you know, as everyone who I pretty most everyone who's um, found. Some, some level of commercial success it experiences this, this rejection. And you know it's part of it. Um, it doesn't, doesn't sort of make it hurt any less. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I knew that it was a very likely scenario. And I didn't want to give up that easily. Um, I also couldn't stomach the idea of another year uh, billing 2,000 hours in this miserable law firm setting. So I took a, I took a um, well, I quit. Um, but in my mind, <laughs> I quit. And um, I, I called it a, a leave, an extensive leave to, to, my, uh, to my father. Of course, my mother I had her full support as a librarian and you know, lover of books. And my father was a little in, in a recession, a little more um, worried about it. But I said, you know, it's just for, it's a self-imposed deadline of one year. And, um, and then I can always return to, to, um, to my law career, my career as a lawyer. So I, I actually moved to London. And, um, and it, people ask Lon why London a lot. Um, Part of it was that uh, my mother's such an Anglophile, and I just had always loved um, loved London and England growing up because of her. I, I think it was also that I wanted very much to have this this adventure, um, this just really step outside of the box and do something really off the off the uh, mat for me. But I didn't have quite the courage to to go to a, a country that required a, a foreign language. My 14 years of French. Um, that never really, I never really picked it up. So, England was safer. So when I got there, it was, um, it was, it was the perfect setting to write because it, it rained all the time. Um, so it was indoors. Um, I had no friends there at all, um, and uh, you know my friends on the East Coast didn't wake up till about one o'clock. So um, it was, it was. I, I recommend it to the to the writers um, who are looking to, to meet a deadline, just pick up and, and, pick up and leave um, and, and go to England and, for a year. But um, I also used to wander past uh, J.K. Rowling. Uh, it very, this is very misleading to say that I lived near her because my flat was just anything but the grand place that she lived around the corner. But I would walk by her flat and um, get all sorts of inspiration you know, from, from the thought that she was up there. Uh, writing the next Harry Potter book, but um, I, so I I started writing something borrowed, which was my first not was my first published novel, and all I really knew when I got to to um, to England, which was actually just a sort of an interesting, um, I I flew out on September 16th, so it was the very first flight they let out after September 11th, um, which was a, a, another sort of bizarre timing. Um, uh, starting point for writing this book because it was really it allowed me. I left New York and I remember seeing the the, the um, Ground Zero smoldering as we as we flew flew away, um, and it was just really uh, writing the novel was very therapeutic. I was able to just completely escape in this world that I was creating and then with these characters. But um, the only things that I really knew when I got there and when I started writing the book was that I, I wanted to write about two things. One was um, 
a, a woman about to turn 30, and I was about to turn 30. Um, she was you know, sort of learning to take a risk and find herself. And for me, that risk was very much quitting my job and, um, and, and, and moving to write this story and pursue my real true passion and love of writing. Um, for, for the character in the book, it was um, learning to, um, you know, she, she was in love with a, with a man, this love triangle, her best friend's fiance. So it was learning to take that sort of risk. Um, it, the similarities stop, stop end there. I've been asked probably a thousand times if I um, had an affair with my best friend's fiance. And I'm always thinking, would I admit it if I had? But, <laughs> but it, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. Um, and then the other thing that um, I wanted to write about was for female friendship and how women are capable of really having these very complicated, complex, um, you know, the, the ability to love and hate each other at once um, in a way that I think men can't really understand. I mean, you'll say, gosh, she's, you know, she's such an awful person. Oh, gosh, I can't stand her. Do you hear how superficial she is? And then you go to lunch with her. And then you come back and then you make the phone calls. You're like, I can't stand her. And then you have another plan with her. Where men don't go golf, you know, they don't go play golf with people they just hate. And if they do, they don't talk about it afterwards, exhaustively. But one of the interesting things uh, is the feedback that I have in this Something Borrowed in 34 languages. And, um, it's, and it's read by all different age groups. The women, the older women in nursing homes who pass this book around, I think it's, it just, it's hilarious because they all say inevitably that there's a Darcy, who's the Kate Hudson's character, this obnoxious girl who you know, lives this charmed life and thinks she's more beautiful than everyone else, every nursing home person or every year will say, there's a Darcy, and she's always stealing everyone's man, going up the halls. And all. <laughs> it doesn't end. It really doesn't end. So, uh, so I started writing a book, and I, excuse me, this is like, the squeeze bottle is never a good idea, Harold Brett. <laughs> anyway. Um, I started writing the book. I met, I met, I it actually took about 14 months. Um, I submitted, I got a new agent, and um, I had a very, very different experience the second time around. I got um, my uh, two book offer within several weeks of her submissions on both sides um, in, in, in London and in, in New York, um, Random House in the UK and St. Martin's in the US. And um, I remember the phone call well. I was, um, it was, in the, it was in the evening, and um, I, the phone rang, and my agent said, you know, congratulations, you know, are you sitting down, congratulations. And, and um, I think to that date, it was the best day of my life. And I, I know I mentioned that I have three children and, and a husband, um, but it remains the, the best day of my life. <laughs> you know, when you get married, you're so worried about everyone's looking at you, and it's just all these set of shallow concerns. And when you have children, I mean, it's, it's painful. So, <laughs> so this remains the best moment. So then um, the, I, I basked in that for, for a, a few days. And I remember just thinking, I can't believe this has happened. And then it, it, the realization hit me that it was a two book deal, not a one book deal. And yes, I had reached my, I never thought beyond that phone call and the dream of saying this book will be published. Um, is that how you were, Susan? Uh, Susan, Rebecca White's my good friend here. We, 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 we've been a lot of panels together. but um, So it was sort of like, wow, I have to do this again. And I have to do it on someone else's, you know, on, on a real deadline as opposed to a self-imposed one. And, you know, I have to write it to please these two editors. And I have to write it knowing that my, you know, my father will read what I'm writing, like the little, you know, you can barely call them sex scenes, but, you know, the, the scene, the, the PG-13 sex scenes, he's, so he's going to be reading them, and it's just, it's a very different, um, it's a very different thing, and it was very hard for me at first. I, I started to write, um, well, first of all, my editor said, do you have other ideas, and um, I don't know about you and the other writers and who've been on two book deals or have had a second one to write quickly, but, you know, I, I had no other ideas, and I, of course, did what any great lawyer does. I lied and said, so many ideas, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> so um, the legal profession was good for something. But I, um, I, I began to uh, revise Something Borrowed, my first book, about this friendship, about this character, try to understand. And one of the things I did while I, while I did those revisions, um, and they didn't even come from my editors in this, in this instance, was just really try to soften 
that character of Darcy and make sure that she wasn't a caricature. Make sure that you know, she, you, women will be able to relate to her and say, I know people like that, as opposed to someone who's just so extreme that, that you, you, you have no empathy for her whatsoever. And in, in making those revisions and in softening her in that, in that manner, I began to be, become interested in her story. And I thought, I'll write a sequel from the perspective of the other friend, because everybody knows, especially when it comes to these complex friendships, there's two sides to every story. Um, so uh, eventually, I, I, I got to the point where I was able to close the door and, and really write and, and, and follow, get in the head of this, this other woman. Um, I had a few setbacks along the way. I, um, I got married after something borrowed, you know, right at sort of the tail end of something borrowed, and then, and then pregnant with twins, and then moved to Atlanta, and then was on bed rest at a Northside Hospital for two months, and I had to stay on my side X number of hours a day, and I couldn't shower, and every time the nurses would come in, they would yell at me for being on my computer, and stress causes preterm labor and everything else. So that was, that was cheery. Um, <laughs> So you know what I did, though, and if you haven't read um, Something Blue at this point, you've had six years, so I don't mind ruining this for you. Um, I, I gave her twins. I gave the, you know, the girl that needs her comeuppance, I gave her twins. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going I'm to really get her. <laughs> Preterm labor, 60 pounds of extra weight, everything I was going through, I would just, I would just load onto Darcy's head. <laughs> but. Um, then the, my third my third book that was that was another hurdle though for me it was it's called Baby Proof um, and it was because this was the first book that I had written that was not the same characters and there was this temptation you know something something borrowed something blue you know something old something new I could have just kept writing these characters but I had never intended to write a series and I didn't want to be locked into this series and I wanted to return to sort of what I love most and that's creating new characters in a new world but it was scary because I knew that that's what the people, the few readers that I had who were, you know, loyal and excited about my writing at that time, that's what they wanted. So it was a risk for another reason. Um, this, this book is about, um, it explores the question of is there ever a deal breaker when it comes to true love? And um, I decided that the deal breaker would be to have children or not to have children. And um, this is a very lofty intellectual um, inspiration for this book. Um, it was when Brad and Jen were breaking up. And the tabloids are a great source for this sort of thing. And you remember in the very beginning before the picture, you guys better, you, you should remember this. Before the picture of Angelina Jolie and Maddox and Brad with his beard or, and Kenya walking along the beach, before that story broke, everyone thought it was because Jen did not want to have a baby. Do you remember that? And people blamed her for it. And even my female friends were like, oh, I cannot believe Jen is so cold and selfish, and she doesn't want to give that man a baby. <laughs> Meanwhile, Angie had completely planted that in the media. I've read her autobiography. Her, no, her biography, her unauthorized biography. But Oh, so little time to read quality books. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so, but originally in my mind, the same thing happened with Something Borrowed. I started that story, and it was like the good girl who was engaged in the and the bad girls doing the fiance stealing, and that was boring to me, so I flipped it and had the, the sympathetic character doing the unsympathetic thing. The same thing happened with this. It was the, it was the couple that marries, they don't want children, she changes, her, she changes her mind, this biological instinct kicks in. Started writing it that way and was, was bored with it that way, and, and once I read this tabloid thing and got into the head of Jennifer Aniston, my, my girl. <laughs> Um, I was, you know, I was, I, I switched it and it became much more interesting to me. Um, and, I, and I got that question a lot about how I had twins, I guess they were, the boys were, um, my twin sons were 18 months or so at the time, and I got the question a lot, how does the mother of, you know, these two adorable little boys get into the head of a woman who doesn't want to have children? And I'm like, <laughs> like for real? You're really asking that? Let's just say this, at around that same time, I had the movie contract um, the, for something borrowed, and, and I had a, I have a, there was a clause that gave me a cameo. And my husband was clamoring for a cameo, when we came a cameo, and he's like listing all the parts that I'm sure that they, they, they ended up, did, they, they cut out of the movie, like the, the mean lol, the partner. And he's like, I could play him, I could do that, I could be the cab driver. So I'm like, listen, you want a clause, you want a paragraph in this contract, nighttime duty, both boys, 10 days, no questions asked, I'm in the guest room. And he's like, 
sign me up. So I retreated to the other side of the house for, um, for some time, and, and he, he hammered it out to get Clause 14. <laughs> but um, out, of, out of my, I think out of my five books, this is the one with the sort of most you know, uh, sociological sort of message about women. I mean, I, I, I never set out to write with these messages, you know, these, these themes in mind. But I really do, I, in, in thinking about this and in thinking about Claudia's dilemma, I do think it's society's presumptive expectation that women become mothers. And if, she, if they don't, if we don't, if she chooses not to, it's either because she, she, is, she is cold, she is selfish. I mean, if, if a person doesn't want to, to be an owner of a, of a dog or a cat, no one would ever say, oh, she's so selfish. She doesn't want to get a dog. And yet someone who knows themselves well enough to know that this isn't the life that they want to choose is, is called selfish. And I, and, I, and I think that that happens a lot. And, and from, from the feedback that I received from, from women of all ages, um, it's very much what happens. These, these women are marginalized. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, it's the last stigma against women. So I, f I felt like that was very interesting. Along those lines, the first sentence of Baby Proof was, I never wanted to be a mother. And it was the only sentence ever in any of my books that my editor fought me on. Um, she was like, this is, it makes her too unlikable. You, you know. And I, like the first sentence of Something Blue is, I was born beautiful. I was a C-section baby with the perfect head. I'm like, you let that, that that's, that's, that's unlikable. Unlikable isn't just knowing yourself well enough to know that you don't want to, to have a child. But um, that was an interesting process. The, the next book, my, my fourth of five, was Love the One You're With. Um, again, I tried to think of universal uh, themes and things that all women can relate to, and really all people, I think, can relate to this one, the one who got away. And if the light weren't so bright, I would call on certain couples who are together, like Red Sweater and Gentleman in the Jacket. I would say, tell us about your one who got away. <laughs> Because everybody, I mean, everybody ha has, has one. You know, not necessarily, you, you might be glad that they did get away, but you have someone that you, you think about. I remember when I was pregnant with the boys, um, temporary housing in Atlanta, it was, I just started to wonder what my ex might be doing. And I got on the not.com wedding registry. You can type in anyone's name. You can see if they've been married recently. I got the wedding registry, I then went to William sonoma I then decided that he needed to get the cow creamer from me. <laughs> so I called William sonoma and said, could I just confirm that, he, that the address of, the, of this young couple is still X, Y, or Z? She said, we can't. You know, she, no, I said, what's the, what's the address? She said, we can't get that information out. I said, well, can you confirm that it's this? And she said, why, yes, I can. And I said, oh, great, let me call back. I don't know if that I want to get the cow creamer. And then my husband comes out of the bedroom, and he looks at me, and he's like the only, you know, 40-year-old man who sleeps until noon. But he looks at me, and he's like, are you doing what I think you're doing, carrying my two children? And I'm like, sorry, I was just curious. <laughs> like, okay. But um, the, other, the other sort of story that happened with that is when I was living in London, my best friend had a rough patch in her marriage. She couldn't get over this ex that she had, which she met was a French exchange student. His name was um, Jean-Pierre, and he was just exactly how you would expect a Jean-Pierre to look. Um, Kevin Costner with a stronger jaw and more hair. And she, she really was in love with him, but she came back, she went to law school, she married another guy, a great guy. Um, and, uh, but she was you know, going through this period where she was wondering about him. So I. Um, at the time was, was engaged and so able, I uh, had more influence over my, um, my now husband at that time and convinced him when we were in Paris that we were going to drive two and a half hours west, this little village called Brazilian Plant in the middle of nowhere, population nothing, um, nothing to see whatsoever because I wanted to get, um, I wanted to see what, where, what Jean-Pierre was doing. So we tracked him down first and so we went to his, it's, it, this is like 10 houses along the stretch of like highway. And the only house that's recessed behind the, 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 this like nine houses is of course his. And I'm like, pull down the driveway. And he's like, what are you crazy? He's like, what are you gonna, I'm like, just we're gonna say we're lost. He's like, if we were lost, that'd be the last house <laughs> in, in France that we would go down. And I'm like, just pull down the driveway. So he pulls down, there's chickens, there's roosters, there's no screens or windows, like there's just like open, you know, windows. And it's just, you know, it's kind of a quaint scene, but I mean, it's nothing that, you know, my friend who just was, you know, felt like she was you know, boxed in in Raleigh, North Carolina was going to relish. And so I handed him the camera, I put it on Zoom, I said, just shoot as many pictures as you can when I get to the door. 
He's like, you got to be kidding me, you know, but he's like. <laughs> so I go to the door, and she comes. I, I, I honestly, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. Rolling pin, bare feet, foot, pregnant, flour smeared here. He comes to the door. I mean, it was just like too good to be true. She's totally on to me. I'm like, you know, faking this, like, for, oh, we, we, I'm lost. You know, she's like, he sees, oops, she was always like, change my name. He, <laughs> he sees Elizabeth all over this. But I got back into cell range. I had the photos. I got back into cell range. I sent them to her. And I'm like, you are so psyched that you didn't marry him. You would be miserable. And she, of course, starts to cry. I was like, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me in my life. <laughs> so that's what Love the One You're With is about. It's about what if you could run into someone from your past and see what your life might be like. Um, and, and sort of a, a more nuanced story than that, I, I, I like to think. I like to hope. But, Brings me to my fifth book, Heart of the Matter, probably the most serious one in that it involves actual marriage and, um, it, it, and children, which I think just raises the stakes. Um, and um, it's, it's told from the perspective of two women. Um, one who's married to a pediatric plastic surgeon appears to have the ideal life. Um, recently gave up her career as a tenure track professor. She's, and, and, and then she, her, her husband, is this, this surgeon, and um, his life intersects one night with the, with the other um, woman in the story whose child is injured at a birthday party. And uh, the book's about a lot of things. Um, some are planned, some unintended, but it was about definitely how one moment can change us in a very dramatic before and after way. Um, it's about motherhood and how, in some ways, that's the most unconditional um, love that there is, but it's the relationship, I think, that requires the most vigilance um, and it's marked by a lot of potential guilt and regret. And so um, in thinking about that, uh, th that dynamic, I realized that that's a lot of why we're judgmental of one another as, as women and as mothers. It's not so much because we're interested in tearing each other down, because it, when, when the chips are down, I think we really do support one another. But I think it's more, it comes from a defensive place of wanting to reassure ourselves about our own decisions. So, you know, if you say, oh, that mother's always on the road, she's never around, you feel better about being a stay-at-home mother. And if you're always on the road and, and, and traveling a lot, you might say, oh, she just lives through her kids like she needs to get a life. And all those things are because we want to believe that the decisions we're making are, are, are right for our family and right for our children. So the book really ex explores that, that dynamic. Um, it's about marriage. You know, we were just hearing about the mysteries of marriage, and that's very much the case with this book, too, how no one can really understand the mystery of someone else's marriage. And I think sometimes even the two people in it can be um, a bit confused about what's going on. Um, there's, there's highs and lows, and there's cycles and moments of despair. And, um, and as I was writing this book, I thought a lot about how, uh, as, as, as Americans, as people, but I think particularly as Americans, we want and expect our lives to be this perfect fairy tale. And the reality is that that's, that's not what happens in, in life. And relationships are flawed, and people are flawed and weak. But ultimately, I think they can be very salvageable. And um, in the end, I do think that those mistakes can become sort of you know, this part of, the, uh, of, a, of a complicated um, narrative. Uh, the book's about reconciliation and redemption and forgiveness. and um, I think it's about soul searching and being able to hear yourself. Um, there's a, I won't give um, the ending away of this, this one, but um, women have all different reactions to this. And there are some women who say, she should never have done this, or she, I'm so glad she did this. And I think a lot of that comes from our own experiences. And I think that one thing that I firmly believe as I wrote this book and as I listened to women talk about this, this book is that you can't, there's no set of rules, there's no roadmap that you can apply and marriage. If he does this, then you do this as a result. Because it's really so much about hearing yourself and following your own heart. And, and, and forgiveness is a tricky and complicated thing, and it's a very deeply personal thing. And it's always, it, it's always confused me, but even more so after writing this book, why people, once again, judge that decision whether to forgive so, so much. Now, I mean, I'm the first one to judge Elliot Spitzer's wife in pearls behind the podium. I mean, just like, don't go on stage. But uh, you know, that's, that's, her, that's her decision, and it's every woman's decision whether, whether, to, whether to forgive. And um, I just don't think we can, we can judge that. Um, so generally speaking, inspiration for my books, they're, they're not autobiographical, as I've said. But um, the, the, 
I write about relationships, so inevitably I'm going to draw on my own relationships and, and, and those of friends and family. Um, I think some writers write to escape their lives, and some writers write to, to, to really about their lives, you know, these thinly veiled um, autobiographies. And I think I fall somewhere in the middle. I write to distill emotions and to understand the way I feel, but um, the, the, the people and, and plots are, are, um, are fictional. Uh, very quickly, I'll tell you about the inspiration for Heart of the Matter. Um, I was at a charity function when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, it was the woman, the speaker, it was for, uh, to raise money for a children's hospital. The speaker um, was a young mother who talked in, in, in the great poignant detail about the birth of her son, who was born with a very rare uh, facial deformity, birth defect, where the face stops growing at about 15 weeks. Um, it requires tw like 20 surgeries. Um, every time that the growth, you know, the rest of the face grows, you need a new surgery. She had like 20 or 30 surgeries from until he's 21. But she talked about the moment he was born and how um, she knew right away something was very wrong. She knew it by looking at him. She knew it by the reaction of the nurses, by the reaction of her doctor, and by the reaction of her friends and family who were in the room. There, were no, there was no um, air of celebration, no balloons, no fl flowers. People were just so scared. And um, she, she, she spoke of the surgeon who came to her when um, her son was 10 hours old and um, took her and her husband and, um, into, into a room and sat them down, introduced himself, and said, I am, I'm the leading surgeon in the world, and I know what this, I've seen this before. I know what to do. And um, we're, going, we're, going to, we're going to do it. He's going to be fine. And by the way, congratulations, and your son is, is beautiful. And she said that that was you know, the first time that anyone had said that, who had said, your son's beautiful right now, and congratulations. And um, I think the story really affected me because I was even more so because I was pregnant and very pregnant. Um, but I, I began to think about her, obsess about her, and what that must have felt like to have someone who came to you and, and, and was, was promising to, to save her and save someone she, she loved, you know, her son. Um, and, the, and just the, the, the enormous gratitude you would feel to, and connection to that person from forever. So that was really the first seeds of Heart of the Matter. And um, I wish I had a shoebox of index cards, but <laughs> I don't write that way. I write with a vague beginning, middle, and end. And um, the characters and, and plots, the characters form relationships, and the relationships drive the plot. And it's just a, it's, it's just a very organic process for me, very inefficient. Um, and, um, and sometimes I'm surprised by the people for better and for worse. And usually I find that, that people surprise me um, for the better characters um, in my books. But my books are very much about, the, the, the press always says they're about um, the gray areas of life and putting, putting sympathetic people in unsympathetic situations. And, you know, I think that that's just, that's just life. I mean, we, we all, I think most of us are very good people. We think of ourselves as good people. We try to be good people and do the right thing. And yet, um, we all are capable of making mistakes and hurting one another. And um, we do it for a variety of reasons, whether it's anger or jealousy or hubris or desire. And we always have a reason. We always have an excuse. And we're often sorry. But um, that's what my books are about. And it's about trying to make the reader feel empathetic for these characters and, and, and treat treat these characters the way you would treat your sister, or your best friend, or your mother if they were making similar mistakes. So um, on that cheery note, we're all ending on really upbeat notes, aren't we? <laughs> um, just we'll talk about Hollywood for a second, and then we'll do some, some Q&A. Uh, the, 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 something Borrowed is, is being made into a movie, comes out May 6th. It's been the most surreal thrilling, thrilling process that it, in much the way, it, publishing isn't like that at all. Uh, I mean, that, I told you about the moment when I got the phone call, and that's wonderful, and there's been some great highs, but for the most part, it's just, it's pretty solitary, and, and um, I, I don't know, am I the only one that's just like so tortured every day? Are you? It's just like t bloody torture. But Hollywood's fun. Um, <laughs> and um, it's, um, I was warned that that, it, that they would take your book and you wouldn't recognize it and they give you no say and all of these things. And I haven't, I've been very lucky. I haven't had that experience at all. 
the director, the, the producers, uh, Molly Smith and Hilary Swank, did The Blind Side, and they were in Atlanta uh, filming The Blind Side, so I met them, and we just sort of hit it off, and I think that I was very careful in the beginning, I should say, not less so in the end, um, but to, to say, oh, whatever you think, this is your movie, you know, I just wrote the book, you know, that all sounds great. And I think in doing that, they just continued to CC me, include me. They invited me to, to LA for, to meet some of these hot actors. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of fun along the way. Um, there were some tense moments with the script. We had a screenwriter, um, and then we had it hired another screenwriter, which I guess is fairly common to punch up the script and to sort of change it. He sort of got into it with the director. The director's just so crazy neurotic. I love him, but it's like, it's like you would not even, it's, it's crazy. He's crazy. So he would write like 25 pages of notes and send them to the screenwriter. And finally, the second writer, his name is Jordan, said like, no, like, I'm not reading another one of his damn notes. I'm like, he's driving. So, so Luke thought that that meant he's reading nobody's notes. But of course, the writer, the writer, the screenwriter was calling me sequestered from a hotel room and saying, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But I was still getting Luke's notes. So he would send me a scene. I would like put my two cents in, send it back, and it take Luke's notes and selectively put things in that I agreed with or not, which was all well and good until we suddenly were at a, a, a crunch time because of the. So anyway, so so Luke reads the draft and he sees dialogue that he wrote that he thought the writer wasn't reading. So he calls me and he's like, Giffen, how did Jordan get my dialogue? And I'm like. I, I don't know. I mean, that's just a total coincidence that he wrote the scene. <laughs> so you would think this man would be happy that his dialogue went in, because if I weren't doing that, not, none of his stuff would go in. But instead, he's like, Giffen, I thought we were a team. You really hurt me. And I'm like, you're a big baby. Oh, then he's on the plane, and he's like, his assistant calls, and he's like, please stand by. Luke's going to be emailing him. I'm like, did you really need to tell me to stand by? Like, can't Luke just email me? Like, whatever. So he calls, and I'm like, get over yourself. And there's a little DVD outtake where we're both sitting there describing this whole thing because, you know, we, we mended fences. But I'm like, get over yourself. You were such a baby. You know, just read the script. And the time it took you to complain and tell me to stand by, you could have, like, read the draft of the script. And, and my husband, we're skiing at the time, and he's like, can I just get help with bath time here? <laughs> he's like, seriously, come on, just take one of them. So um, yeah, it's been it's been great though. The, I saw the I saw the screening um, about a month ago, um, one of the early screenings, and it's I forgot as I was watching it that I um, that I had written the book. If that I mean I know that sounds really strange, but it was sort of just like I was going to see a really a really good movie. So I mean, it's way surpassed my 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 low expectations of what I was you know told to have. Um, it's, it's great. It comes out May 6th. Everyone go on May 6th. It matters so much, like opening weekend. But um, it's a smart romantic comedy. It, it's, it's, it really is. It's, it's one of those romantic comedies. And, and I wish more movies were made like this for women, where you're not told exactly what to think. It's not all black and white. You don't know what's going to happen until the very end. And again, I felt myself this, this feeling of suspense, and I wrote the book. I knew how it ended. I wrote, read the script. <laughs> A million times, but um, it's 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 a really it's they did a great job, and I'm so excited and feel so lucky. So that is all for today, and um, thanks for hanging in there. I know I'm the last speaker of the day, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have a few questions? Yes. Who were some of those hot? Awesome <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I'll tell you who 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 got the role is um, Colin Egglesfield, who is not um, he's not he's relatively unknown, but he is absolutely gorgeous. The trailer's out right now too, so just go to Yahoo and then type in something borrowed and and my name, no R in Giffen. Everyone puts the R in, including Mary Hart on Entertainment Tonight. I'm like. I've been waiting my whole life to be on Entertainment Tonight. She calls me Griffin. <laughs> Kidding, sort of, but um, but he's he's gorgeous. John Krasinski actually steals the whole thing from The Office. Do you know him? He's um, he's he's incredible. So it's setting the sequel up well. Um, he's 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 great. The, the cast, the whole cast, did a wonderful job. Um, and it, they, they don't look like the, some of the characters that I described, but they really all capture the, the essence.
Um, I know all the men have read it, so out there. <laughs> Be man enough to read a pink book. I mean, seriously. <laughs> we have time for one or two more questions? OK, we'll do two, two, two more questions. Start. Do you think you'll ever weave any of your legal background into any well, to weave, the question is, would I ever weave my legal background into future books? And if you want to be mind-numbingly bored and read about document reviews and warehouses in Syracuse, New York, <laughs> then maybe I will. Asbestos litigation, I mean, it's really riveting. Um, no. <laughs> I'll spare you that. And one, one more? Anyone? Yes. Your, your first book that was rejected. Right. <laughs> is it likely now that that would be accepted immediately because of your reputation now that you submitted? Um, you know, I've been asked about the, the book, and I, I, my, my answer always is, you know, I don't want to hold something so precious up to commercial scrutiny, and this is book is for myself. <laughs> But it's really not very good. <laughs> it still wasn't bad enough to get it. They all rejected it. A little bedside manner. But um, yeah, I think I'll just leave that one on, on the shelf. But OK. OK, sure. What is that you're working on now, or that's about to come out? Don't you have a book that's going to come out again soon? No. I don't. My book, um, my book is about 42% um, written, according to my latest word count. Do you do that? Like, I'm like, okay, all my books have been roughly 105,000 words, and therefore I'm here, so I'm at 40. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not close. But it's a book about um, the, the, the first chapter will be on my website next week, and it's, um, it'll be on the back of the paperback on March 15th. But it's about um, a, a woman who has kept a secret for, um, for 18 years um, and sort of the power of that secret and sort of what, what um, happens when, when it comes to light. So it's a little, I'd say it's a, it's a little bit uh, different. For me, but so was the last one. So I don't really know. I don't know even know what that means anymore. Um, but um, anyway, thank you all so much.